Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is, hello, yeah. My name is Paco Pangalangan. I'm the Executive Director of Stratbase ADR Institute. And welcome to today's virtual town hall discussion on secure and reliable cloud banking for economic recovery. Uh, thank you for all joining us this morning. Uh, I know that uh, we, this is the second time we're trying to have this virtual town hall discussion. Uh, because of the typhoon, we had to cancel it the last time around. So I'm very happy that you were able to join us uh, this time. Uh, please note that this, the proceedings are being recorded and that they will be uploaded to YouTube and uh, to our social media channels. Also, again, please use the uh, Q&A function to relay questions over to our speakers for later. Uh, but enough of, of uh, some of the house rules. May I please now uh, welcome the president of Stratrace in our EDR Institute, Professor Victor Andres Dindo Manhit, to formally open today's program. Professor Manhit. Sorry about that, I was still on mute, but good morning to everyone. Good morning, Paco. Thank you for introducing our virtual town hall discussion. Happy to have this, uh, given what transpired a few weeks back, and we had to cancel this. So welcome to everyone, our participants, speakers, for a virtual town hall discussion on secure and reliable cloud banking for economic recovery. Here in Strat-based EDR Institute, we have trapped challenges and risks in our country when we had this global pandemic since March of 2020. And part of this uh, risk that we have identified, we also see opportunities. Whenever we simply look at risk as an opportunity or a crisis as an opportunity to turn it into opportunities to improve and grow. And one of this is what we have seen in terms of digital divide. We have seen this lack of access to digital technologies as a risk, as a crisis, given what we are experiencing in this new normal. But we can also see an opportunity that as we see all these numbers at the start of this year, mobile phone connections, internet users, social media users, or even other numbers with regards to financial inclusion factors. There is a big opportunity that we can speak of to use digital technology and even cloud technology, especially as we look at more specific digital payments over here. It reminded me of what uh, we have seen in different newspapers that the health crisis has accelerated digital transformation of society and its adoption to financial technology capabilities. The Philippines has marked record high transactions, both in number and volume of fund transfers, payments, and spurs during the lockdown period. But it's up for us to really adjust to this new normal. And even a World Bank study that I came across on the digital or the Philippine Digital Economy Report 2020, it speaks of the urgency of digital payment services as essential to our shift to a digital economy and the digitization of our financial services industry. Here in Strat based ADR Institute, we have long believed on the power of cloud technology. We have a strong sectoral research on ICT. And I remember more than a decade ago, and we were looking at it with my colleague, Paco, he was a young graduate of UP10 on, on how ICT is shaping our society. And cloud was being introduced to us then. I remember 2009. And this digital payment and remittance systems that we know have become a preferred mode of facilitating the flow of money in this time of restricted mobility 
and physical distancing prevent the spread of this virus from Wuhan, China. We have seen since March that in a matter of weeks, Filipinos have learned to trust cashless transactions using their mobile devices as a convenient and safe interface for everyday business, which for millions whose means of livelihood have been disrupted has become a critical tool for survival. However, most Filipinos still do not reap the benefits that digital finance allows. We continue to take note of poor and unbanked are still using cash payments, putting themselves and others health at risk. For all the benefits of existing cloud-based technologies that all industries are now rushing to integrate in their operation, there are inherent security risks that must be addressed with responsive and enabling policies that encourage the collaboration and investment of the private sector guided by the public sector. I think on the seventh month of this year, July, I, I remember a statement that we issued in Stratford. And we spoke of the Philippines' needs to transform and be open to new ways of doing business in order to be globally competitive. The government must actively invest in innovative practices and improve the bureaucracy so that efficiency in the delivery of public services may be enhanced and ICT ventures may be up. I spoke then, or we spoke then, about bridging, bridging the digital divide post pandemic. Again, good morning to everyone, and I would like to welcome you and thank you for participating in our virtual town hall discussion on having secure and reliable cloud banking for economic recovery. Back to you, Okay, thank you, Professor Manhit. Um, tamang tama po, our, our next speaker, our first speaker uh, for today's program is Ms. Chuchi Funasher. Uh, good, good morning po, Ms. Funasher. Um, we are grateful to have with us uh, yeah, Mr. Chief Wanna Share from the yeah. DSP. Mm -hmm. po, ma'am. Okay. The floor is yours, Paco. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Paco. Um, so, um, good morning, everyone. Congratulations to Strat Base ADR Institute for organizing this event, uh, of course, despite, uh, you know, challenging circumstances. And of course, to our Strat based ADR Institute president, uh, Victor Andres uh, Dindo Manhit, distinguished officers, fellow speakers, guests, participants, good morning once again. Um, many of us are witnesses to the rapid advances in digital technology and how they are transforming the financial services landscape. No doubt the roller coaster ride of innovation we are all is for consumers, businesses, transformation into a digital economy is inevitable. It's never been truer. And the current global health emergency has only emphasized the need for us not just to accept this reality, but also to respond to its call of harnessing the power of technology in more creative and courageous ways than we are used to. The surge of digital payments during the lockdown period is a clear indication as to how we as a nation can change and shape reality as we know it. It is worth noting that during the ECQ period, 4.1 million new accounts were opened through fully digital means without any face-to-face -face or human interaction. And this was made possible by the BSP supervised financial institutions, or we call them the BSFIs for short, that are equipped with online, electronic know your customer or the EKYC protocols and systems for a contactless and fully digital client onboarding process. 
The BSP has been laying the groundwork for an expanded digital finance ecosystem in the last decade. And at the heart of our pursuit to enable digital financial services is our advocacy to promote financial inclusion and inclusive growth. Various initiatives have been plotted forming part of the puzzle of economic success, which are all marked by the diversity of players responding to the varying needs of businesses and individuals, especially those who have been traditionally unserved. Now I am delighted to be able to shed light on one of the important initiatives for this Monday, utilization and recognition of the cloud-based technologies as a tool for inclusivity and efficiency among financial institutions. In 2013, the BSP had a foresight to ensure that we cultivate an enabling environment for innovation including the cloud-based technologies as we see its growing recognition and application. So BSP Circular 808 came into fruition, which provided a comprehensive IT risk management framework, guiding entities in managing IT-related risks. Uh, aside from providing a structure on technology-inclined risks, it gave a particular focus for cloud-based technologies to set context with regard to its definition, classification, vendor management, and compliance related items such as governance, due diligence, security and data privacy, data ownership, and business continuity management arrangements. Um, I'm sorry about that uh, background and there's announcement. It's a part of our um, Reminders here inside the BSC because I'm here in the office and we do have those reminders every now and then and um, we cannot turn it off. Sorry about that because it's it's really a moment <laughs> for it's, it's no we, don't problem, have, we don't have control on that. Sorry about it. It's okay, but yeah. So I, if I may just pause for a while, not to sure, but it's not really a man that long. Okay. Unless that if you can still hear me, I can proceed. We can actually or we can somehow hear you well. I think. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's a kind of... pipe in and okay, so we don't have control. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an important health announcement. We don't have control of that. Uh, yes, yeah, it's a pipe in. Uh, anyway, I think it's done. Uh, okay, sorry about okay, no, it. No problem. No problem. <laughs> yeah. So, um, setting this framework paved the way for the breakthrough initiatives in the banking space, emphasizing the importance of these um, technologies. So, a rural bank in the south uh, rose to the occasion and showed what cloud-based core banking is all about. So Cantilan Bank embraced the technology and proved that taking the leap will make a big difference in achieving their mission on financial inclusion. It was a milestone not only for the rural bank, but also for BSP, given that the pilot run was under the BSP's test and learn approach, also known as regulatory sandbox which symbolizes the BSP support for um, experimentation, for innovation, while remaining vigilant on the possible threats or risks posed by emerging technologies. As the first BSP regulated bank in the Philippines to fully rely on a cloud-based core banking system, this is a breakthrough which regulators from emerging markets can emulate, particularly for financial institutions looking at using cloud computing technologies. With Cantilan Bank's experience, many lessons were obtained, especially around the benefits that this technology can offer. Cloud-based core banking is a possible computing services on demand. In effect, a lot of huge capital for IT investments may already be foregone among financial institutions, particularly the smaller ones, as they would only need to incur operating expenses commensurate 
to the services that the organization requires. And it also allows banks to gain access to critical infrastructure and computational resources that would otherwise be out of their financial reach or are too complex to manage. So smaller banks would be able to deliver electronic banking services that can compete with leaders in the industry. And furthermore, cloud computing can be an alternative channel for business continuity and disaster recovery arrangements. Through the cloud, replication of data is automatic, consumes very a little computing power, and eliminates the need for acquiring and maintaining duplicate hardware and so software. Hence, redundancy and high-speed replication can be achieved without entailing significant costs and investments. Since Cantillon's implementation, a significant number of financial institutions took stride in using cloud-based technology for core banking. And to date, 20 banks have been utilizing cloud in their core operations. 16 are rural banks, two of which coming from universal commercial banks and thrift banks. Noticeably, majority of these banks are small ones given its advantages for them. And there are also 11 ongoing applications among thrift, rural and cooperative banks who are looking at utilizing cloud. As we see more BSFIs getting onboarded and while we recognize the valuable impact of cloud-based technologies, we are also at the process of ensuring that a safe and sound financial system is maintained. In light of the BSP's test and learn approach, we conduct an iterative process in enhancing our cloud computing policies to ensure that proper controls are always in place and that we maintain an enabling regulatory framework environment for the supervised institutions. Thus, we are currently revising our cloud computing regulations as a result of our assessment, um, consultations, engagements with financial institutions, and scanning of evolving framework from other regulatory bodies and international standards. Essentially, the proposed amendments aim to ease restrictions on outsourcing of core banking systems and break other long-standing myths that securing BSP cloud approvals is a difficult process. The forthcoming version will also incorporate updated supervisory assessment framework that's safer and the assessment of material or non-material impact of the activity which provides guidance on the approval to outsource. And this is a way of espousing the importance of cloud-based implementations that was emerging, but is already within our midst. In other words, we are recognizing cloud computing as a key enabler of the new normal in banking. And moreover, we hope that these amendments will encourage BSP supervised financial institutions to consider cloud-based solutions in their undertaking while still adhering to the risk-based regulatory framework. At the latter half of November, the BSP released a framework for digital banks um, upon the approval of the monetary board. So it was only recently that the board uh, approved uh, the digital banks um, licensing framework. So this framework includes the guidelines to be able to establish a digital bank in the country and includes capitalization requirements, classification, and how should digital banks operate. Overall, it provides a blueprint to inform how banks can draw up new strategies to compete or collaborate with emerging online players and maximize the economic benefits of the shift to the digital economy. We are cognizant that the adoption of a digital banking business model should be underpinned by robust, secure, and resilient technology infrastructure effective data management strategy and practices, and sound digital governance. So digital banks are exposed to the same set of risks identified in the BSP's risk management framework. 
Thus, they are expected to have effective governance structures and risk management processes that appropriately identify, manage, and monitor the risks attendant to its business model, strategies, processes, and products. And as such, they shall be subject to the same corporate governance and risk management standards applicable to other bank categories with due regard to the application of the principle of proportionality. With all these developments, tech disruption in the financial sector is apparent. It is only a matter of time when holistic digital transformation will take place. The challenge for all of us is to be able to equip ourselves with the right knowledge, skills, and mindset in order to come to terms with these changes. So we are seeing this among financial institutions, which are gradually welcoming cloud technologies in their operations and transitioning from on-premise or the brick and mortar systems to provide services to their customers. Indeed, it is up to us to maximize these technologies for the benefit of all. So the BSP recognizes that the road to digital economy for the Philippines is bright and auspicious. For the BSP, this agenda has long been imprinted. And hence, we strive to promote an environment of continuous, given the country's strong macroeconomic fundamentals, advancements in technology, and influx of engaging providers and clients. It is undeniable that we, as a nation, are ready to continue the digital transformation journey. In the face of challenges and threats, technological innovations can be a tool for survival. If channeled the right way, responsible innovations can curtail financial inclusion barriers. Accordingly, the BSB advocates the promotion of financial products and services that are suitably designed, priced, and tailored to diverse market segments, including the unbanked and underserved markets through pioneering delivery channels. We continue to encourage digital innovation alongside key mandates of maintaining monetary and financial stability and the efficiency and safety of payments and settlements systems. This digital transformation is made more significant given that this global health crisis has caused a reduction in physical banking touch points, compelling clients and industries to traverse and discover financial activities through virtual avenues. Nonetheless, the BSP has prepared solutions within its regulatory purview which support the new economy setup and ensure that the pace of digital transformation proceeds hand in hand with caution and adequate risk management system. From this pandemic, we need to emerge not just as a new economy, but a better nation. There is no playbook on how we can reshape the economy in our continuing digital transformation, but we can be guided by our resolve that innovation and collaboration need to work hand in hand in the service of the unbanked and most vulnerable. Thank you again and good morning, everyone. Thank you, Director, uh, Deputy General uh, uh, Chuchi Fonacher. Ma'am, if I may, can I just ask you a couple of, of questions before we move on to our next speaker? Okay, yes. Oh yeah, just, just some quick ones, Paul. I, I have one here uh, asking, how real do you think cyber, cyber threats are for, the Fili for Philippine customers? And what do you think banks can do to mitigate- How real? How real? Uh, yeah, okay. How, How real? real? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, are cyber threats for Philippine customers? And what do okay. you think banks can do to mitigate these risks and protect customers? Yeah, actually, the cyber threats are really real and it will always be there because as um, we evolve, it comes to uh, advances in technology. 
these uh, people there also in the dark uh, mm -hmm. are also, of course, um, upgrading, or should I say, um, even not just keeping in step, but exceeding or anticipating that this is the direction uh, as far as advancement in technology is. But as regulator, we have uh, regulations for banks to uh, observe. And in fact, one of that is not just, of course, having their own robust uh, uh, IT uh, uh, framework within the bank. Uh, we have uh, circulars uh, issued on that, information security management framework, circular 982. And then, of course, we have this, um, what we call the event-driven um, reporting requirement from, from banks. When we say event driven, like for instance, it's not actually already yet a full blown, let's say, a cyber attack. Uh, although there are just indications of, um, let's say, some some cyber threats, then um, the, these banks, um, our supervised institutions, are already required to report to the BSP within two hours. Within two hours, they need to report that, and with this. Uh, we need to, of course, uh, have this mechanism uh, to alert the industry. So we have a framework, of course, within the BSV, which I cannot uh, provide in details. But uh, rest assured that um, the BSV as the regulator would uh, be really protecting the interest of uh, not just, of course, the banks themselves, but the customers as well. So. When we say it would be, it would be a, um, I say a hypocrisy if we say it's not real. It's real, but um, it's also in the way that banks would be really, um, should I say, um, resilient in responding to to these cyber threats. So they're expected to be um, um, resilient in the sense that uh, once they have noted um, these kinds of. Uh, cyber threats, uh, they should be able to um, go back or restore the systems in a matter of um, a few, if not a few minutes, in a few hours. But yeah, it's really, it's really real because we're, we're in now, we're in this economy where um, everyone is, of course, already embracing uh, technology as a way to manage our day-to-day -day, um, activities. Okay, but yeah, and I was thinking like part of, of the bank's resilience, I guess, or at least for me, would be to, you know, to always be open and looking for these, for these, you know, emerging technologies that would help them increase their, yeah. their security yeah. for customers. And, and in line with that, I was just, I just wanted to ask you, Nirinpo, like what, what your opinion is on adopting, you know, emerging technologies like AI and, and machine learning to monitor, detect and identify threats in advance. And, and again, do you think that banks currently have these capabilities? <laughs> ah, yes, of course. They have these capabilities. Uh, AI, machine learning is very useful. In fact, we just we would just like also to inform that BSP uh, is the first one to, I think, um, in, in, in all of the regulators to adapt to, to the AI and machine learning thing with the... Uh, with the launch now of our uh, BSP online body, or the BOB or BOB for short. It's a chatbot we're in. Um, this is a way for uh, financial consumers to uh, uh, bring to the attention of the BSP to communicate to the BSP through that chatbot, uh, their complaints, as well as even concerns about certain things uh, which the regulator sh should be able to uh, be um, I mean, to, to know if they have complaints. So it's a chatbot making use of AI, of course, uh, machine learning. So um, as, as information are also being uh, collected there, it's a way for BSP to be uh, also, um, let's say, to flag or um, anticipate or even um, issue policies and regulations to address the, the gaps, the deficiencies that have been pointed out due, uh, in this in this um, space, meaning because they can um, engage the chatbot and so the information there 
can help the BSP also um, craft appropriate uh, regulations and policies to address uh, deficiencies and gaps. So it's really, we're really open to, and as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, okay. we should embrace, of course, uh, the first one to embrace should be the, the regulator. But then, of course, there are, uh, we know that there are attendant risks to that. And that's why in the test and learn approach, the regulatory sandbox, if there is some uh, pioneering, uh, let's say, um, product or a service that they, uh, let's say the institution would like to offer, well, we welcome the idea of having uh, uh, them, let, let's say first, on, or in, enter into that kind of approach, uh, the test and learn approach. It's a controlled environment. It's not yet, um, the regulations and other um, uh, policies would not yet be applied to that, but with a, within a defined period, we can observe. And so we would learn how really to, um, Uh, let's say regulate that particular product and even all section is something that uh, uh, BSP is really actually embracing, but of course with uh, appropriate uh, control. So innovation is something. Sorry. Hello? that uh, uh, we should be able to be open about but at the, you know, to new products and services okay um last i have one more question here that pt governor i hope you don't mind uh yeah here just one it, it was a, a mail a phone-in question how do you think <laughs> banks can bring out of the box thinking to achieve IT infrastructure resiliency, redundancy and agility, and scale to support these new emerging business models. Uh, oh, <laughs> this, uh, uh, I'm hoping it makes sense to you. That particular question, the when you say thinking out of the box, yes, well, it's something that uh, the test and learn approach can really be made use of. I mean, the regulatory sandbox is there for. Um, any proponent to approach BSP and um, describe how it will be. And so we can have, we can have a defined period and, and, and maybe also uh, I have with me a colleague, uh, Deputy Director um, Ace Alvaro. Um, he can also, from our, uh, we have this group we call the Technology Risk and Innovation Supervision Department or TRISD for short. So he can also shed light on more technical aspects of the question, <laughs> but that one thinking out of the box is we're encouraging, of course, and that's why we have this test and learn approach, the regulatory sandbox, because it's there uh, for us to um, test, let's say, a new product or a new kind of um, system or um, um, service, but. Uh, we just have to, um, of course, define parameters and, and under a controlled environment. It's not; it would not yet be open for use by by everyone or by all banks. So proponents can have um, can engage uh, Trisdy. And so, uh, as I mentioned, I have with me uh, Ace to uh, also yes. shed <laughs> more light. Ace, can you also uh, yes. uh, uh, add to what I have just mentioned? Ace, can you uh, speak about the yes, the um, uh, thinking out of the box? Yes, yeah, yes, okay. the yes, the Juchi. Um, I'll just start my video also so everyone can see. <laughs> Hi, yeah. So yes, Paco, just to build upon um, the Hi, Juchi, uh, statements on thinking out of the box, I think it's also important to, uh, for the B this BSB financial institutions to. Um, adopt a digital mindset in the sense that uh, it will it will emanate from that digital mindset since the digital mindset are those sets of viewers and opportunities that uh, they could that allows them to recognize the potential possibilities that these emerging technologies can uh, offer or to enhance their existing level of operations so it start from there they, they should build a digital mindset and then after having that mindset they could look upon 
what areas or um, of their operations can be can be improved. They should not on their on, on their laurels, so to speak. They they should they should evaluate. Um, they should be open to changes because without it, they might be left behind. So it's really it's really up to them to be proactive, adapting a digital mindset, and realizing the potential benefits of these new technologies in their operations. Mm. Yeah, Helpful. thank you, Ace. Actually, it's really being open-minded. You know, that digital mindset. No more yes, of the really. traditional. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Ace. Yeah. Thank. Thank you. Thank you, DG Chuchi and Ace. I hope yeah, you, you you can both stay on for some more questions in the open Later. forum. Yes. <laughs> okay. but, but for now, I, I'd like to thank you, yes. DG Chuchi, yeah, thank you. for also. for sharing your time with us. Thank you, Paco. Place. And yeah. telling us more about BSP's plans, and and obviously, I really my takeaway is really the openness of the BSP for innovation and and technology, cloud computing. So thank you very much, Paul. Yes. Um, and we'll see more of you later. Uh, yeah, thank you. So thank you, thank you very much. So ladies and gentlemen, that was Deputy Governor for Financial Supervision uh, Sector of the BSP, Ms. Chuchi Fonasher. Uh, so. For now, let's let's move on to our to our next speaker. Our next speaker represents the Banking Association of the Philippines as as as, as its president. He is also the CEO and president uh, of Bank of the Philippine Islands. Uh, unfortunately, um, he's Mr. Bong Kon Sing. Um, I'm sure we're all familiar. Unfortunately, he's unable to join us today because there was a death in, in the family, but still he was uh, gracious enough to, to send us a, a pre-recorded video presentation, which we will be playing for you right now. Thank you to the Strat-based ADR Institute for allowing me the opportunity to make this presentation on cloud banking for economic recovery. Today, banks face many challenges. There's competition from fintech. There's increased regulation that followed the global financial crisis. There are different work arrangements because of COVID. There's the need for financial inclusion. Low interest rates are making the generation of net revenue from funds much more difficult. And of course, with economic hardship comes increased loan losses. Digitalization can help in a big way. Digitalization lowers the cost to serve finances are more secure. It's much more accessible to access clients online or mobile. And obviously, because you're not with face-to-face -face contact, infection risk is lower. But digitalization also produces its own challenges, cybersecurity issues, for example, and a question as to the role of branches in banking going forward. We have four pillars of digital transformation in BPI, and this is true for most banks. Each of them is anchored in cloud computing. First, there's platform. Secondly, people. Third, analytics. Fourth, journeys. The last two, analytics and journeys deal with big data, the use of data science, and the hiring of data scientists. Cloud banking uses cloud computing for certain bank functions. Here, you use data stored on external servers, access via the internet. The network is a shared pool of resources, networks, servers, storage, application servers. It's ubiquitous, it's convenient, and it's on demand. There is no longer the need to build your own pipes. You use services that you can access via the internet. There are clear benefits of cloud computing. One, greater strategic value because of increased collaboration. You have a competitive edge as a bank. You can focus on your core business instead of worrying about the regular processes. Two, there's better efficiency. Your products can get to market faster. You have greater accessibility to your customers and your cost to serve declines because as you digitalize, that replaces more expensive human-related processes. And third, much increased flexibility. You can scale up, you can scale down. You're not dependent on your fixed pipes that you have in the back room. There's a choice of technology and there's a choice of deployment models 
the last two I'll cover in the next page. There are basically three cloud computing models. First is software as a service. Here, we use cloud-based application software complete with user interface. Secondly, platform as a service. Here you rent a predefined platform for software development. And finally, infrastructure as a service. Here you rent storage and computing capacities on other people's servers, all right? There are three deployment models. There's private cloud, basically one of your own. There's a public cloud, you're using a public resource, all right? And there's a hybrid, it's a mix between private and public. And there are three major service providers, the top three being Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. This COVID pandemic has demonstrated the importance of cloud computing. Just think about working from home and what you need. You need remote connectivity and access to information. You need communication and collaboration platforms. You need software application development. You need to be able to manage your workforce and contact trace. And there's the requirement for business continuity and resiliency. Think about that absent the use of the cloud. All right, so each of these cloud computing models can address these needs. But there are cloud computing risks. Number one, high switching costs. If you use one vendor, it might be very expensive to switch to another. Two, regulatory demands, okay? The regulator requires that certain standards be met. And there is a question as to whether the cloud or the use of the cloud can meet those standards. Next, you have security and privacy concerns. How secure is your data? Can you meet all data privacy requirements? And finally, vendor capabilities. Is your vendor, is your cloud provider truly up to providing the service you need? That being said, net-net, the use of the cloud is a big plus. Above the line, it encourages innovation. There'll be new ways, more efficient ways of working, better integration, all right? And below the line, think about operational resiliency, better IT security, and frankly, a pay-as-you-go model. You only pay for what you use, right? You're not reliant on big stacks of rails with high fixed costs and high initial capex. Net-net, the use of the cloud will increase or enhance revenues. It will reduce expenses. And that increased profitability will lead faster recovery for banks. In the Asian financial crisis, it took banks six or seven years to get their profits back to the level of pre-crisis. In the COVID crisis, with the use of the cloud, my guess is it will take only three, maybe four years. That means stronger lending earlier. That means stronger equity growth earlier. And in summary, that is why cloud banking enhances GDP growth. Thank you very much. All right. So thank you. That, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was Mr. Bongkon Singh, uh, the president. Oh, sorry. Let me just turn on my video. OK. I hope this works now. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, so, yes, that was a, a video from Mr. Bong Kon Singh, uh, the president of the Bankers Association of the Philippines and CEO and president of BPI. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Tito Ortiz. Uh, Mr. Tito Ortiz is the chairperson of the FinTech Philippines Association and the chairperson uh, Dist Distributed Ledger Technology Association of the Philippines. He's also the Vice Chairperson of Union Bank of the Philippines. Please welcome Mr. Justo Tito Ortiz. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. In my previous talks, I mentioned the various mega trends that shape the future of banking, of which there are Three, the deconstruction of the firm, the hyper-personalization at scale, and the collaborative 
commons. What's relevant in today's discussion is the mega trend that we call the deconstruction of the firm. In 1991, Nobel Economics Awardee Ronald Coase asserted that corporate structures tend to integrate operations and support services within the organization because their marginal costs get cheaper as they reach economies of scale. This notion, however, is today being challenged with the rise of cloud-based services easily accessible to all enterprises, micro, small, medium, and of course, large. Access to outsourced microservices in platforms hosted in the cloud gives smaller companies competitive advantage over vertically integrated and highly bureaucratic corporations because they are not burdened by large fixed costs from labor and tech and capital investments. A small company can subscribe to an ERP system for the cost of $7 per month or to an HR or payroll system that costs $1 per employee per month or to a sales and marketing tool for $10 a month. They don't need to hire an IT team, build from scratch, or buy their own servers. All these are available off the shelf, do it yourself, in minutes without any need for technological sophistication. It's that simple. This provides small companies scalability on demand and agility to deliver better customer services and the logistics to get their products and services sold in markets outside of their geographic community. This enhances their reach and their productivity, allows them to grow market share faster and thus compete better with larger corporations. Union Bank has long recognized this mega trend that we have our own initiatives to tackle it. Union Bank Global Linker is a free to use digital transformation portal for MSMEs. It aggregates all the microservices that MSMEs need to construct a digital enterprise on subscriber-based cloud services provided by various tech company partners. MSMEs can choose from a variety of affordable solutions based on their business goals. Like I said, they can avail of an ERP system from Q for a basic fee of $7 a month. MSMEs can have a ready HR and payroll system with Salarium for just 50 pesos per employee per month. They can subscribe to Taxumo's tax filing services for a minimum of 1,500 per month. Financial services are also available, such as Box, a digital and over-the-counter aggregated payment gateway, and CCAP, a lending platform using transactional data to underwrite credit. The Global Linker platform with our partners offers more solutions in the following categories. One, working capital and financial services. Two, skills and productivity improvement. Three, legal and administrative services. Four, e-commerce platforms. Five, professional and trustworthy market presence. And six, business processes. And since all of these have been curated by the bank for its global linker community, rates are even lower compared to the partner's regular prices. Just imagine the savings, but most of all, the increased operational capacity 
brought about by Global Linker's 34 partner service providers delivered to more than 38,000 MSME customers that are today in the platform. Global Linker is just starting, but we are pleased that it is already making a big impact to several businesses. For example, Lynn here, one of our Global Linker members, was badly affected when COVID hit, as she was heavily reliant on trade fairs and bazaars to sell her products. But after building her online store in Global Linker and participating in DTI's digital trade fairs, her exposure grew. What she used to earn in two or three physical trade fairs can now be made in just a month's time. Her online business helped her bounce back from the crisis and digital transformation was a big part of her success and all of it was made simple by Global Linker. She even received bulk orders and interested buyers from abroad. Indeed, our MSMEs can be world-class if only provided with the right skills and tools. Economic recovery is ultimately anchored on enhancing the productivity and increasing the value created of the key players that drive economic growth. In an emerging market as such as the Philippines, MSMEs comprise the majority of the country's economic establishments and workforce. They are the faster growing businesses and have the greatest potential to be the next big corporation or even multinational. Their recovery, especially amid this pandemic, is key to the country's overall growth. With the help of technology and cloud-based subscriber services, we can help MSMEs tech up without much capital and human resource. We can help them achieve world-class processes, higher productivity, and scalability on demand, and greater market reach. MSMEs become more competitive and thus prosper, contributing in a meaningful way to the country's overall economic growth. The pandemic has accelerated the digital tipping point. Today is therefore the best opportunity for MSMEs to digitally transform. With Union Bank as the platform provider and curator of business solutions and others like us, in partnership and collaboration with tech and service providers, we can help tech up MSMEs for a faster and sustainable economic recovery. Thank you all. Great, yeah. Uh, yeah, everybody, that was Mr. Justo Tito Ortiz uh, of Union Bank. Uh, yeah, it's just great to hear from, from our, you know, our banking sector how they've embraced technology and the cloud, and and how they see the potential in in these sort of in this sort of digital transformation for for Filipinos, uh, especially uh, in terms of COVID post pandemic economic recovery. Uh, so yeah, next up, our next speaker is none other than. Mr. Andres Ortola. Uh, he will be joining us today uh, to share his perspectives of the tech industry regarding matters on developments and possibilities of the use of, of technologies for the financial service sector. He is the general manager of Microsoft Philippines. Uh, let us please welcome Mr. Andres Ortola. Hello, thank you so much, Paco. Can you guys hear me okay? I guess, yeah, yes. I can hear you. Very well. Thank you, Paco, for having me. And, and thanks, uh, Dindo, uh, only for the invitation. It's a privilege uh, for me to be here this morning. Always 
amazing to hear how progressive the ecosystem in 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 financial services is becoming. It, it, it's 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 really good to hear all the all the all the good uh, the good traction that the new technologies are having. So today, I wanted to bring a little bit of a, our point of view on what we've seen around um, the financial services sector, what's happening. We're seeing not just in the Philippines, but also in other in other countries to see some of the things that are happening around the world. Just, just let me, allow me to start with some things that you probably already know, which is the key trends that we are seeing in, in the industry. From the expanding power of, of uh, fig, uh, big technology companies and fintechs getting closer to the financial sector, um, more regulatory costs, evolving customer expectations and have been shifted during 2020 to even more online experiences. Um, legacy systems um, not probably collaborating with, the, with, with that speed required and a surging demand for new products and services. I think when we put this all together, um, we have a picture of what a retail bank is, is, is going through right now and please for the industry experts in the in the audience today forgive me for a non-banker attempt a description of or a simplified description of what a what a banking or retail bank business should look like but in our simplified view again a retail bank operates on 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 four basic blocks of businesses you have payments clearinghouse wire deposits um, lending through loans and credit cards, and uh, finally, wealth management. That has been operated through a traditional multi-channel uh, access to customers, through branches, mobile, and web. If we start looking at the regulatory constraints, and again, this is not just the Philippines, um, the Philippines um, landscape, it's, 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 it's broader. Um, there has been regulatory constraints for a bank, necessary measures that had to be taken such as you know stability reserves or or anti-money laundering capabilities uh, know your customers capabilities but at the end of the day when you look at the margin all of the industry these are undifferentiated requirements that everyone has to com com um, compile comply with and not driving any any top line or any margin to it in a way the banks themselves are becoming captive of that traction and so it comes open banking. Open banking uh, as a new wave of, of services offered to markets. Together with open banking, we saw the emergence of what we call in Microsoft the aggregators, which are huge, massive platforms that allow banks to access millions of users, millions of users. But in a way, perhaps it's a bit extreme, but in a way, diminish or in some cases make disappear the traditional multi-channel uh, experience from the bank. And the way this is working is, as you've probably seen all this, payments, for example, start to happen within these platforms. If you go to more advanced markets, we see customers moving, moving funds around on these platforms of so different payment uh, solutions uh, without having to go back to the retail bank or to the bank itself to, to process that transaction. And obviously that drives a, a reduction on the business on the, on the clearing house or um, the, the wire transfers, which again erodes a little bit more the margin. Merchants are actually coming into those platforms to actually get direct access to the same amount of big uh, the customers that are out there that are paying their payment capabilities and they can, they can access the products and services right there. I love this quote from, from um, the chief data scientist from, from Ant Financial, which is the born in the cloud institution that you, you probably know. The insurance product is called screen damage insurance. We don't recommend that to everybody, only to ladies that bought skinny jeans. The logic here is you have a skinny jean, you put your phone in your pocket, and most likely you'll have an accident. Now, what's interesting about this is that information, that insight is no longer at the, at the use of the institution. It's with someone else. And that someone else will decide where to broker that transaction, where to broker that little, little loan, micro loan, micro credit card um, uh, 
transaction. And again, eroding the possibility of having a higher margin on this particular transaction. So the lending business is also being affected. So when you look at this happening at scale in all banks, and again, this is happening at a worldwide scale in some more, more, about, more advanced banks um, uh, markets, this competition, this, this, this new landscape is actually affecting the majority of the retail banks. Some markets have made attempts on, on offloading uh, money, money laundering and know your customers' uh, utilities and capabilities to third parties in an attempt to sort of recover some of that margin or, or offset that cost to someone else. And that somehow worked. But the reality is, as the margins shrink, there are less and less institutions that can be actually transacting and doing business online. And that is what I personally, I've heard the term uh, from, from someone I really like is what we call compressive disruption, which is different to a disruption itself that you probably have seen in other hospitalities, travel transportation type of disruption. This disruption is a compressive one which will act very slowly and will erode and is eroding margins and margins of business, shrinking and compressing the, the oxygen that financial institutions might have to operate. And as you all know, COVID-19, 2020, it didn't help. It didn't help anybody and, and let alone the financial institutions. We see um, interest rates dropping, a, a big, big um, decrease on, on, on mergers and acquisitions. Uh, US, 15% of, of prime insurance, uh, car insurance actually being refunded as users don't need to pay insurance, car is in the garage, what for? Uh, and last but not least, and something that is actually very, very uh, vivid right now in, in the Philippines is the loss in SMB activity, the loss in SMB um, market, which accounts for about nine, more than 99% of the companies here in the Philippines. And so all this together, um, goes for building higher resiliency. And we've seen many, many customers operating in this, in, this, in, this, in this landscape, trying to build greater resiliency. The first is to respond to the crisis, to, to, to try to navigate the now, deal with the safety of your employees. How do I connect? How do I keep on, on the lights on? The second phase has been recovered. How do I, how do I come back? How do I get back in, into serving my constituents, my, my customers, other organizations, how do I keep on business? And last but not least, which is I think the most interesting opportunity we have is to reimagine and how are we gonna reimagine our capabilities and our business in the future, in the near future. We believe that this is a function of four uh, big blocks and four main blocks, if you will, the first one is the most important is, is a technology as a platform. Technology is the driver for innovation, a technology that is trusted, non-competitive, that, that drives and fosters a culture of innovation that makes innovation accessible to everyone. Digital skills, it's, it's no longer an option. It's something that not just the financial services are going through. It, every, every organization right now will face more and more the need to becoming more digital and, and hence skill, skilling will be a big part of the conversation. And last but not least, having organizations that are resilient, that are structurally solid to endure uh, this type of crisis. With Microsoft, we, we have seen evolving situations all around the world, and we, we probably can, can probably um, define into main five main scenarios where we see our customers going really hard. The first is empowering employees through teamwork. I've heard it uh, earlier from, uh, from one of our speakers. Uh, the, the, the teamwork of, of, of this new hybrid world will happen in, in, in the branch, at customer sites, at home, everywhere. And, and this term that I coined uh, FIGITAL, which basically is the, 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 the almost the overlap of the physical and the digital experience, that's something that companies are aspiring to get and, and it's a necessary capability to build in these days. 
manage risks across organization. As we move into this new, new world and as we get more digitized, the ability to unearth insights from the information that is already there uh, and, and use it to predict what the business opportunities are, what uh, the risks are, it's essential. Um, more than ever, deliver differ differentiated customer experiences. That, that, that experience has to be consistent and differentiated and customers are demanding this more and more and more. Payments and, payments and core banking, uh, you heard it before uh, from my fellow speakers, it is no longer an option, it, it is coming. Uh, there is great advantages of, of running these two uh, capabilities on the cloud on flexible and flexible infrastructures. And last but not least, financial crime and how do we how do we really get ahead of the game on 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 on, on financial crime and on fighting financial crime in a, in a more digital world so the, from our point of view cloud does drive a greater operational resiliency and when you look at the regulators and i'm glad i i, I sort of were paraphrase uh, miss chuchi when you look at the, the, the expectations from regulating bodies are no longer what it used to be. Right now, it's, they, it's, the cloud is seen as an enabler of new innovations and enabler of business. Financial ecosystem will have to operate in the new and in, in the crisis and the pandemic, but will have to comply and continue operating in, in, in the new normal. Cloud needs to be and will be regulator enabled and trusted, which are very, very core concepts to Microsoft um, nowadays. And there will be, there will continue to be an oversight. So this is essentially a, a need of, of opening and being transparent about the relationship with the cloud vendors and providers such as Microsoft and the regulating bodies. That's what we have been investing, not just now, but for the longest time on, on complying local regulations, international regulations all over the world. When I take a same lens of technology, key technology building blocks that this uh, cloud technology will enable, will we'll have ready for you. I said it before, data as, 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 as a fuel for growth um, and our ability to have a, a properly governed and trusted data estate that is managed and is, and is uh, flexible enough to allow tools like artificial intelligence or machine learning to go and unearth that information for you. Uh, elastic infrastructure, the ability that every company has right now to access a, a almost unlimited, you could say it's unlimited infrastructure power, globally distributed, heavily reliant, absolutely reliant and flexible. Blockchain and IoT, and, and combining the power of these two, te two emerging technologies to offer experiences and tailor experiences across your customers, across your channels, and across your uh, partners and vendors. Agile development platforms and the ability for, for um, the banks to build, develop, and market um, products faster, whether it's mobile platform, API basic base uh, technologies. And last but not least, identity and security man identity uh, management and security. All these, all these, you could say, uh, are components of what we understand as the tech intensity or technology intensity, which is the function of a company of, uh, of creating new technology services and capabilities or absorb capabilities that are built and quickly absorb them into, into the operation um, to the power of trust, which is how can you build trusted technologies in this environment at the right pace? Here's a simple example of how we uh, working with some of our customers uh, around the world and what we call the three horizon planning, which your first horizon is around keeping the lights on or evolving, not sorry, evolving the way you keep the lights on, to all the way in horizon three to the more transformational um, conversations like data exchange management. All this in a continuum of evolution that can be managed and controlled. We at Microsoft are already looking and working in the next frontier, the next wave of innovation. And we believe it's gonna be around this area. It's gonna be around pervasive security 
How do I make sure my, my users, my information, it's secure, safe, it's governed uh, across my channels, no longer in, in all my, within my walls, but across the channels, across my own ecosystem. Great personal experience, no longer, okay, great personal experience will be the new competing area, the new, the new uh, uh, game uh, field. Location awareness, if you combine this, the power of this two and get those experiences location aware and, and tailored to who you are and where you are in that new environment, it, it's actually super powerful. And we believe it's, it's, it's something that uh, companies will start looking into that very, very, very seriously. Human-centric interactions. You need to now, th that experience will expect to be extremely multi-channel and the, the use of, of um artificial intelligence powered agents that it can understand your speech, that can see what you're seeing, that can give you advice. It's super important. We have been investing in this front and, and uh, some of you might have seen that here in the Philippines, we have the first and only Filipino speech to text translation. So this could be something that could enhance um, human interaction, uh, chatbot, chatbot or, or, or uh, virtual agents interaction in Filipino, in English, or even in other languages. And last but not least, deep customer analysis. How do we move from where we are and getting some information about our customers to moving to super advanced deep, deep uh, customer insights and make, get those insights transformed into action? So I hope that gave you um, a little bit of a uh, our point of view on what's happening in, in, in the banking industry right now, we are extremely excited to be part of this, of this conversation. We understand and we have helped many customers around the world to move and to take these journeys. So I'm super happy to, to continue working with some of you into what we believe our mission is to empower every person and organization and banks in the, in the world to, on the planet to, to achieve more. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here again. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Thanks, Andres. Yeah, that, that was a, <clears throat> sorry, that was a, yeah, a great presentation. Uh, I, I was really happy to hear from, from the tech sector, um, being a non-banker <laughs> non myself, you know, and to hear how, you know, technology and, and, and banking sector are increasingly overlapping as, as, we, as we move, you know, forward through this increasingly digitalized uh, world that we live in. Um, yeah, so, but, you know, without further ado, I, I just wanna move, over, move on to the, to the open forum, uh, if that's okay with you, Andres. Um, okay. So, uh, for the open forum, we'll be joined by our speakers, Andres Ortola from Microsoft, uh, and our two BSP officials, uh, PG Chuchi Funasher and also Mr. Alvaro, uh, the Deputy Director and Head of Financial Innovations and Policy Research Group of the BSP. Um, obviously, uh, our two speakers from the from Union Bank and BPI will not be able to join us for the open forum. Um, so I guess all that means is that we can talk about them because they're not here. <laughs> That's usually how it goes, right? Those who, if you don't show up, uh, sometimes people end up talking about you. I get the action oh. items <laughs> yeah. to lose. Yeah, but, uh, well, well, uh, well, thank you everybody for, for all of the insightful presentations this morning. Um, I see there are a lot of questions, understandably, a lot are for the BSP, but of course, I I I, uh, I hope that Andres can can just jump in if he thinks he can you know add uh, to the to the conversation. Um, but anyway, let's just let's uh, let's kick it off with uh, with the first ones. Okay, so here I I'll try to bring some structure to it, but but please forgive me if if it's kind of messy. But okay, so. Here we have a question here. Um, it's again about the, the business, emerging business risks. So I guess this is a good question to start with because the, the BSP and, and, and Microsoft uh, speakers 
can, can weigh in. And the question is, how do you think banks should address emerging business risks impacting their brand, capital, and customer confidence? Do they have to review their existing security posture as they rethink their service delivery? Your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, um, yes, Paco, thank you. Yeah, actually, um, the BSP is also set to come out with our um, um, issue once or a regulation on, um, uh, should I say, um, you need to protect the the um, your your um, your posture or your um, or meaning as a bank you, you need to prepare for instances when um, there could be some uh, attacks or developments that will impact your um, your um, standing as a bank. So um, I think. It's, it should be uh, really looked into as to the root cause of that uh, to be able for the bank to address uh, such a, a challenge. Meaning to say, if the root cause some something to do with uh, in the delivery of their of their products and services, then, then it's something that they should be able to address. So it's not just uh, looking at, um, um, let's say uh, that the problem on the surface, but rather digging deeper into the root cause of it. So as I said, if the root cause has something to do with the delivery of the product or service, then um, it would merit, of course, an attention for the, for, for the bank to focus on addressing, let's say, it's a system related. IT related. So um, I think it's um, should be incumbent upon them to really understand uh, what's causing the particular um, um, issue or uh, nowadays more so that uh, with social media, <laughs> uh, it can easily just be passed on to, to another uh, person. So the bank, uh, this is where resiliency is really important and that the BSP is emphasizing this uh, actually uh, to, to the banks, to uh, resiliency, not just in communicating to customers, but more so in addressing as well the, the root cause of, of the problem. So um, that's where we, um, as I mentioned uh, heard, um, a while ago, or at the start of, of my uh, my statement about um, um, the bank should uh, really uh, uh, be able to protect uh, the, the the standing, um, and that's where um, the BSP would like them to be uh, able to um, respond right away. Um, it would not just be um, let's say a matter for uh, service delivery, but even perception or... Um, um, so it, it, it's, it, it should all boil down to really understanding and it, it should have a root cause diagnosis of the situation. Right. So it, it will not just be a superficial way of addressing the issue. I see. I see. Yeah, I'd probably like to add to Ms. Chuchi's statement. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think understanding it, it's essential. Uh, we, we've seen um, our, the customers, our customers that are successful uh, managing this, I believe is a component of three items. The first, you need to have the right technology, like Ms. Chuchi was saying, to know what happened. You need to have a technology platform that allows you to, to unearth that information, trace that information, et cetera. The second component is processes and governance. The technology alone won't cut it. You need the right process, the right governance to make sure two things. I mean, totally aligned. You first anticipate that could happen. You can no longer be only responding. You need to be anticipating, you need to be a little bit ahead of the game. Um, and of course, you know, how are you gonna govern a response when an incident happened? And last but not least, transparency. The world of today, and I think uh, I couldn't agree more with your statement, Ms. Chichi, is today's world is all about transparency. 
It's all about handling the, the, the emergency situations and problems will happen. The difference will be on how you respond, how well you communicate, what's your transparency around the issue that will make a difference. And all this has to happen in a very agile way, way very fast. Uh, you cannot allow yourself to wait for weeks until you come up with a statement. People will demand it in instantaneously. Very big topic. On risk yeah, but, yeah, but for the one I mentioned about the regulation, I, I failed to specifically mention it. It's about reputational risk. So right. reputational okay. risk management uh, will be coming out with that regulation <laughs> because, yeah, you, you need to... to I mean, the bank should need to take a look at it holistically. So yeah, um, that's okay. the that's the one that uh, we uh, I mentioned about the uh, regulation that we are set to to issue as well. The bank should be able to manage the reputational risks. So what's causing? What are the risks that are linked to that? It could be, yeah, uh, the one mentioned by Andres or um, systems or anything or. It could also be people risk, but as a whole, the bank should really be able to manage the reputational risk and the action should be faster. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Um, so you know, moving from you know, the reputation, reputational risks that you were discussing earlier, we have another question here. It's, you know, it's a bit different now. It's how important do you think it is for banks redefine their technology infrastructure and governance models, which I think we mentioned a bit earlier, to support the new operating model of remote work with maximum security. So I, I guess I will probably take a little bit of that one first. Sure. Uh, but how important? Um, I think I would probably put it in the least dramatic way is no longer an option. It is no longer an option. Um, at the pandemic, even in the Philippines, we've seen all sort of reactions to 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 the pandemic. But we clearly see that the people that, that the companies that were ready, that were that had a technology infrastructure that, that was ready, reliable, they 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 quickly move ahead of the game. We can we could see customers uh, of both ends uh, not really coping, not really being able to get people productive. Um, and we've seen it, uh, and one of my key learnings in, in this whole journey is for many companies and banks included, it is no longer it how ready you are to, to cope with the situation. It's also how ready your supply chain, your partners, your ecosystem is. In situations like this, you might be connected, but if your company, if your partners and your, and your ecosystem is not, then, then you lose, then you lose big time. So for leaders, my biggest learning is I need to look at how ready my company is, how quickly can we react, but also have this conversation with my key partners. It's how ready are you? How ready are we to, to react to, to this, to the situations? Yeah. Um, yeah. Of course, um, it's very much <laughs> real when I say like, for instance, you cannot evade anymore the work from home arrangement. It will really now be a part of the, of the new economy. And so the company or the bank should be able to uh, support such an arrangement. So for uh, the more technical terms about it and how to prepare, I think I can, if I can call on my colleague, uh, Ace. Yes, signature chief. Uh, yes. Yeah. So okay, you can emphasize on the, the details of such a requirement for them to be able to cope with the, such an arrangement. Ace. Yeah. So with respect to um, the question on um, this uh, new arrangement, new work arrangement, it is important. Again, we, we touched upon earlier about the importance of a digital mindset. And so it's really, again, going back to that. It's really going the, the recognition of uh, we are evolving right now the the way that we do did things two three years ago will, will be very different particularly in light of this ongoing pandemic so it, it is important for the entities to realize what will be the way moving forward so for for now when 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 you're doing work from home arrangement it's important for you to 
look at what are the potential threats that you should be able to uh, counter or to prepare for before you're not thinking about securing the end user access, given that you are accessing these services from the comforts of your office. So where the where your IT department are all there to be able to ensure that all the controls, the physical controls, the environmental controls are all there. Now, when do when, when now that what when most of our employees are conducting work from home arrangements. So it is now very important to, on top of those existing controls that they have in place, end user access and endpoint user access and security should be improved to, to ensure that uh, the, we, we could, we could uh, I could talk about some certain technologies such as the, such as the virtual private networks, and uh, and the use of multi-factor authentication when they are when they are utilizing when they are connecting to um, th their systems in, in in their head offices. So these are just some of the technologies that must be now taken into serious consideration now that we have um, evolved in the way that we are doing our day-to-day -day, um, roles and responsibilities. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Ace. Thank you, DJ Chuchi and, and the rest. Yeah, um, okay. If I may move on uh, through, I think we have a few more questions here and we have time for them, so, so that's good. Um, ooh, okay. Do you think internal cross-functional collaboration is important for banks to successfully manage customer requirements, business operations, and risks? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I, yes, it should be really internal collaboration, but I guess uh, for the more technical uh, approach to that, ACE can also, can yeah, also really provide yeah. a perspective, um, but definitely it would need really internal collaboration. ACE, would you like to emphasize yes. on something as yes. a requirement? <laughs> yes, so for collaboration should be... Um, uh, a key a key core value that uh, should be nurtured in every institution and contextualizing it on how we are doing things now so um with with uh sh entities should be able to support um work from home arrangements and this collaboration where imagine um your employees will not be going to their usual place of of work so it IT, uh, the IT departments or the IT infrastructure that is uh, being oper operating in, in every institution should be able to support these types of arrangements where sh there should be um, a mechanism for, for them to securely access. And, uh, and like for this, for instance, this activity that we're doing right now, where we're conducting, where we're conducting uh, workshops or we're conducting town hall discussions. So imagine this can be simulated during um, the, when, when doing your useful task. So from the banking perspective, um, your IT operator should be able to have remote access being secured for them to ensure that their IT operating data centers are able to support with the increase in the demand of um, demand for payments, demand for online transactions that is now being the preferred option of, of our of our consuming public so given their lack of mobility so it, it is it, it it is really up to every entity to look into whether their existing it infrastructure are capable to be able to um elastically uh el elastically meet the demands of 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 the changing demands of the consumers during these times of particularly during these times of the pandemic Maybe maybe I can add to, to good good points there. Um, I think one one thing that um, emerged super clear in this in this pandemic is is I think we we'll probably spent a, a moment defining what collaboration should look like. Um, for good and for bad, the the world got connected in calls like this one. We believe collaboration is a lot more than this. We believe that there's there's power of getting absolutely people connected and and. and over, over a conversation like this one, but if that is not integrated into the, the, the way you do things normally, it's not secure. 
it's not integrated in your documents flow. If you can be talking to you, but at the same time, editing a document, secure, so working in real collaboration, it's only then when you really start unlocking collaboration across the, the company. And, and another point that people, sometimes we, uh, I would say, when you say collaboration, we instinctively think of, of okay, you know, a Zoom call or a Teams call or a, it's, it's the access to data. If there is one thing that actually made even Microsoft transformation possible was our ability to get data accessible to everybody. Right now, if I, when I, I'll give you a personal example. When I sit down with my manager in, in the region to review our business, we both have access to the same data, live, real time, same dashboards. We'll look at the data and we have a very productive, collaborative conversation versus me having to prepare pages and pages of reports, putting the information how I wanted it to be and, 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 and tailor that conversation. I think in, in even when you, when you manage to get that, we call it democratizing of information, that real collaboration really kicks in because people do connect on what is really needed. Um, th those are big, big learnings for us. And one last topic I want to add uh, to, to Ace's point, also, it's important not to not to forget for 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 you to enable collaboration, even more cross company collaboration. People need to uh, companies need to invest in skilling. Our teams have to be well skilled to be able to use these tools, whether it's remotely in the office at home. They need to be well skilled, and skilling has to go has to be essential to our tech build up, if you will, our, our the digitalization itself. And typically that is a not as prioritized item. And we've seen customers having access to the technology and yet users not really harnessing the power of it until you start uh, driving adoption, driving usage, driving skills, and then you get the whole, the whole solution, the whole package um, of collaboration un un unlocked. Great. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Yeah. Thanks, Andres. And, and to Ace as well for, for answering that question. Um, okay. I'm going to turn now to some of the Q&A questions that have been submitted uh, through the Q&A function. Um, so I can see some of you are checking it out as well. So, but I'll, I'll start with, uh, with, okay, we have one here. It says each day the border Borders in the banking ecosystem are getting blurred with the rapid digitization of financial transactions, with non-bank players getting involved, consumers demanding for more personal and customized services, and other distributors making previous policies and regulations being outpaced by these changes. How does the BSP see its role in policy setting and be a disruptor itself in this new digital ecosystem? So this is a question for the BSP. Yes. Uh, digital team. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. Ace can uh, <laughs> can respond yeah. to that. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Okay. I I think um, digital team already touched upon uh, a point uh, with respect to uh, her uh, presentation earlier. Um, our approach to innovation has always been very open, but we are also recognized that the pace of the um, trends in innovation, the the pace of changes. Will it's just too fast for for the regulation to be always be um, in place to cover the to cover to cover those activities. So what is the BSP do, doing? So the BSP has this um, test and learn approach, our mechanism. So even with the, even when there's no specific regulation that will cover this evolution in the complexity of the business models in the implementation of the technology, we are able still to have an oversight function to, to, to oversee these services, given that we allow them to be, uh, to be deployed in a live but contained environment. But at the same time, um, be because of doing that, the promised benefits from these new business models, from these new implementations of technology can be realized. But at the same time, we are ensuring that adequate safeguards are, will be in place, will be inserted. In, in the implement in the pilot implementation, for instance, we have this um, three areas where where 
we call as non-negotiable. So while we are allowing these innovations to be uh, piloted, we just remind the entities behind this implementation to make sure that the risk on cybersecurity, on consumer protection, and, uh, and of course, the anti-money laundering should always be upheld. So as long as um, these three areas are being adhered to, in terms of during the during the pilot implementations, then these initiatives can be can be allowed to operate. So in a way, uh, that, that's that's our that, that's that's how we approach these types of innovations. We recognize again that that there that the existing regulations may not always be there, but we do have a test and learn approach and a regulatory sandbox mechanism that can cater to these developments. Great, yeah, thanks, Ace. Uh, we are down to our last few minutes, last couple of minutes for our open forum. Uh, I can, I'll just throw out one question here. Uh, well, you know, there, there's one here about, uh, how computing can be the platform for the unbanked, but how can that be done? when internet is unreliable <laughs> and spotty and in places, what can the BSP and uh, BAP do to solve this problem? Of, of maybe this is really a question for the DICT if we had them here with us, but uh, yeah. I don't yeah, know. Paco, but if I may, because course, there are okay. also developments because uh, BSP has recognized really that as a barrier right now, meaning of course, connectivity, addressing connectivity challenges uh, especially in areas uh, in the in the low lying areas as well as remote areas, but we have this uh, BSP is also coordinating uh, not just with the ICT but um, if if um, with the permission of course although uh, this is not preempting as well maybe the governor later on uh, making a a pronouncement on this but we are actually reaching out to the executive. Uh, department so it's really in the office of the president on how this can be addressed not at the not just at the DICT level but you know making use of satellites for areas that is not yet reached by um, by the telco um, towers and all <laughs> yeah. so there is this move so that the the people would know that uh, BSP is also exerting efforts for that to be addressed but it's really a live problem and we do recognize that that's why no less than the governor actually himself um, uh, reaching out to the executive branch to be able to uh, have this addressed so those kinds of things uh, previously there are i think there are uh, legal um matters that might that should be addressed but you know, it could be executive orders or what. So that's why uh, the governor is reaching out to, to, the, to the office of the president on this. So making use of yeah, the possibility of, uh, of those satellites. Yeah, Actually, that if, if I, I'll, oh, yeah, go ahead. If I can add just, just a little bit um, to, to, to the G uh, front of here. There is a lot of investments that we are doing in what we call hybrid cloud. Uh, uh, acknowledging that this is not a problem only to the Philippines, it's, it's everywhere, um, but particularly in, intense in here. We're trying to build our cloud offerings and what we call the hybrid uh, set of solutions. So right now we can have a full power of the cloud um, enabled, but at the same time, we can take the similar power to closer to what is needed and have it connected on a, on a different type of connection. We right now have devices able to give you Azure experience, Azure services, Azure cloud services through LTE, through satellite, through um, even TV white space in some countries. So there is, there is a new technology emergence of solutions. When it comes to hybrid cloud, the cloud itself shouldn't be considered as one monolithic uh, set of approach it's, it's in, in the cloud or nothing. We see it more as a, as a set of different solutions, different delivery methods, if you will, all the way to the end, all the way to chips that can be put anywhere else. Those chips will have some local capabilities some local data processing capabilities, for example. So there is there is a lot of technology being, being built and being delivered 
include in, also here in the Philippines to try to address or mitigate part of that connectivity issue. Great, and, and I, here I was thinking that that question wasn't gonna elicit any, any nice answers, but actually it, it was, that was quite interesting. A lot of nice insights from, from both the DSP and the technology industry. Uh, you know, definitely when it comes to connectivity and, and things like this, it, it's definitely an area uh, for collaboration with the private sector and the government. Um, and uh, yeah, we look forward to, to you know, of course, broadband, in, in, uh, the reach of internet improving so that even more Filipinos will be able to enjoy the benefits of the cloud and the benefits of, of being backed. Um, so yeah, with that, maybe unless anybody wants, you know, I can give the floor to any of our speakers if they want to have some, uh, give a few last words before I close the open forum then. Uh, but if not. I will probably uh, go quickly first to allow the GT Funas here to, to, close, to close the floor. Uh, thank you for having us here. Uh, great discussions. I think uh, the questions are the right set of questions. I, I, I'm, I'm pleased to see that the, the question of cloud or not cloud is probably no longer the, the, the question. It's more about how do, you, how do I manage risks? How do I cope with different things? So very pleased to see that. Uh, I think trust, compliance, uh, the, the right technology partner in this case is essential. And we are hoping to, to become one of those trusted, trusted partners for, for the ecosystem. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah, from the BSP side, as um, I have also just presented the openness to innovation. And actually, if we can call this um, or be identified to the supervision brand of the BSP is really uh, putting emphasis on engagement. So to engage us, if you feel like there's something where uh, BSP should uh, not just saying pay attention to but if there's something that the bsp can can do as well so uh feel free to reach out to us um yeah um and also of course uh to my colleague the the group of of ace uh the technology risk and innovation so there's just only innovation there supervision supervision department would also be glad to hear out um, any, let's say, proposals or enhancements or any concerns. Um, so thank you. Thank you also for this opportunity for the BSP to uh, be heard about this space. <laughs> thank you, Pop. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, BG Chushchi. Thank you, Ace. Uh, and thank you, Andres. And also, of course, um, to our two speakers uh, from Union Bank and BPI, Mr. Bong Consing and Mr. Tito Ortiz. Uh, at this point, please allow me to formally close uh, the open forum and briefly, just briefly uh, give some closing remarks on behalf of Stratface ADR Institute. Of course, uh, you know, I'd like to thank our speakers and our participants this morning in our virtual town hall discussion on secure and reliable cloud banking for economic recovery. The event has, has gathered public and private sector stakeholders from the banking and financial industry to discuss the augmented adoption of FinTech in the Philippines for financial inclusion and business continuity of all sectors, sectors towards economic recovery. As the world continues to combat the COVID-19 pandemic, it is apparent that the new econ economy is digital. The health crisis has accelerated digital transformation of society and its adoption of fintech capabilities. The Philippines has marked record high transactions in both number and volume of fund transfers, payments and disbursements during the lockdown period. While the leadership of the BSP has acknowledged the crucial role of fintech as an innovative provider and enabler of financial services, the potential of the industry also comes with manageable risks. In the advanced world of technology, the fitting digital solutions must be harnessed to ensure development of fintech. Cloud-based technologies, artificial intelligence, blockchain are among the various examples of accessible keys to the digital transformation of the financial sector. The responsiveness of the financial service industry in synergy with government is critical to all of society approach 
in rebuilding economic resilience and reaccelerating economic growth to pre-pandemic le levels. To quote one of the comments from our, our Q&A participants, um, I too believe that digital banking and cloud banking is, is the way to go. And I look forward to having deeper, lengthier discussions on threats and risk management in the future. Thank you very much, everybody, Professor Manhit. So thank you for allowing this uh, event to make this possible. Thank you to our speakers and thank you to all of our participants. Uh, we will be providing, for our friends in the media, we will be providing press kits of, of the presentations from today uh, for you later in the day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, Paco. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you, Dino, Paco. Thank you. <laughs>